While his platoon approaches on foot, the commander of the first platoon, with his reconnaissance detail, proceeds in motor vehicles to Anderson's farm, which is a designated assembly area for the platoon. Here they park their vehicles, dismount, and unload the reconnaissance cart. From cover at Anderson's farm, the platoon commander observes the terrain to the front, comparing details with those on his map and pointing them out to the reconnaissance corporal. He makes plans for his reconnaissance with a view to selecting position for his mortars and an observation post. A suitable location for the mortar position is soon found. It affords good cover, the vegetation and trees obscuring both the mortars and their crews from aerial observation. The platoon leader indicates to the reconnaissance detail the approximate location of each of the mortars and directs the corporal to establish an observation post on a hill near the position of the mortars. On his map, he carefully points out the location of Anderson's farm the area to be screened with smoke, the mortar position, the observation post, and the ammunition dump. Wire communication will be established between the observation post and the mortar position. The platoon leader sends a runner to Anderson's farm to meet the platoon and to guide it to the selected position. He sends his ammunition sergeant to Cranberry to locate the site of the ammunition distributing point. Meanwhile, wire is being laid between the mortar position and the observation post. The reconnaissance corporal supervises the staking out of the positions for the mortars so that there will be no delay in their installation when the squads arrive. From the map, the platoon leader and the reconnaissance corporal determine the range and the magnetic azimuth to the target. From the range table, they compute the number of propellant rings to be used on the shell and the elevation to be set on the mortars. The meteorological observer determines the direction and velocity of the wind, which he reports to the platoon leader so that the firing data can be corrected accordingly. After the computations are completed, the reconnaissance corporal directs the alignment of aiming states on the line, mortar, target. The magnetic azimuth of this line is carefully checked by the platoon leader, who uses a lens attic compass. As the platoon approaches the mortar position, it comes under hostile artillery fire. It quickly leaves the road, moving across country in an approach march formation with wide intervals between squads in order to reduce casualties. It arrives finally without serious losses at the mortar position, where the sergeant, who is also platoon executive, reports to the platoon leader for instructions regarding the installation of the mortars. The platoon executive takes charge of the emplacing operations. Carts are unloaded, mortars are carried to their positions, and ammunition piles are established near each mortar. Holes are dug for the base plates. Mortars are set up, sandbags are placed about the bipods and the base plates to reduce the effect of recoil. After the ammunition has been unloaded from the cart and piled at each mortar position, the ammunition sergeant, who has returned from Cranberry, takes charge of the ammunition cart and leads them back to the distributing point for replenishment. Trucks from the regimental train have arrived at Cranberry, the platoon distributing point, and after unloading their cargo of ammunition, proceed to the army depot at Taneytown to refill. The platoon leader from his observation post sends the firing data by telephone to the executive at the mortar position. This part of the initial fire order indicates the type of shell to be used, in this case, white phosphorus, range, seven rings, elevation, 815, and the azimuth for each mortar. The platoon executive, in turn, transmits the data to the mortars, where it is applied to each gun. He will notify the platoon leader as soon as he is ready to fire. At the ammunition distributing point, camouflaging operations are in progress. The ammunition sergeant arrives with the empty hand carts, reloads with ammunition, and starts at once on his return trip to the mortar position. The installation of the mortars and the preparation of ammunition are completed. Mortar squads are digging individual foxholes in the vicinity of the mortars for protection from hostile artillery fire. 
The executive informs the platoon leader at the observation post that the mortars are ready to fire. The platoon leader sends a message to his company commander, whose command post is now established at 1st Brigade headquarters. He states that his mortars are in place west of Hill 490 and are ready to fire. He sends a similar message to the commanding officer, 2nd Infantry, whose attack he is ordered to screen. At 12.58 p.m., the command to fire is given. A salvo from the right. At two second intervals, each corporal, from right to left, gives the command to fire. By observing each burst of the salvo, the platoon commander is enabled to adjust the fire and to ensure that the target is completely covered with smoke. The burst of number four mortar is too far to the left. The range on all four mortars is short. At the observation post, the platoon commander estimates the necessary increase in range and the change in deflection on number four. He transmits his correction to the executive with the command for five rounds volley fire. The required corrections in elevation and azimuth are made at each mortar. After which, the executive gives the signal and the platoon begins to fire five rounds volley fire from each mortar. The projectiles commence to fall in front of the hostile line, and immediately the smoke screen begins to take shape. The corporal of each mortar squad supervises the firing of the five rounds at the rate of one shot every two or three seconds. Firing is continuous until the designated number of rounds is completed. A misfire causes one of the crews to fall back and wait for one minute before unloading the faulty round from the mortar. From his observation post, the platoon commander carefully observes each burst and watches the smoke screen spread across the landscape, quickly blotting out from the eyes of the enemy all activities of our attacking troops which take place behind it. Having successfully established the screen by means of the five round volley fire, the platoon leader now orders the rate of fire reduced so that the mortars are fired from right to left at five second intervals. This is sufficient to maintain the screen. At 1 p.m., two minutes after the firing of the initial salvo, the smoke screen is covering the entire hostile position. The infantry leaves its line of departure and advances under cover of the smoke screen. Casualties are reduced to a minimum. Accurate fire direction on the part of the enemy is impossible. Following the establishment of the initial smoke screen, it becomes apparent that due to favorable wind conditions, two mortar squads will be able to maintain the screen. Accordingly, two squads are ordered out of action. The two mortars still in action, each fire at the rate of one shot every 10 seconds. The two squads which were ordered out of action with such ammunition as can be carried in their ammunition carts are following in close support of the attacking infantry. Having pushed back the enemy from its initial position, the infantry advance continues. However, a portion of the line is suddenly held up before a strong hostile position from which is coming heavy rifle and machine gun fire. The supporting mortar squads of the chemical platoon are called upon to blanket this position with smoke in order that our infantry may continue to advance. Blinded by the cloud of smoke, the hostile defenders are unable to see beyond the limits of their protecting clump of wood. The effectiveness of their fire is thus greatly reduced. In the late afternoon, the infantry has pushed through to its objective. It now faces the Red Reserve position. Reorganization has taken place and the attack will be resumed at dawn. The platoon is once more intact and during the night fires a gas concentration on the enemy reserve position, using non-persistent gas to hinder hostile preparation for a counter-offensive and to prepare for a continuation of the attack in the early morning.